piece of the International Space Station smashed into a Florida house. Evidence for the first stars in the universe, and NASA is having to rethink its Mars sample return mission. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. In March, a resident of Naples, Florida was at home when he heard an extremely large sound crash into the house, a couple of rooms away. He went and examined the source of the noise and found that it was a chunk of metal that fell through his roof. And right away, people thought, okay, this is a piece of space debris. But you know, we've heard this kind of thing plenty before. Well, this week, we got an official report from NASA that yes, indeed, this chunk of metal that hit his house came from the International Space Station. Back in 2021, NASA switched out one of the battery systems on the International Space Station, and they took the old battery platform and they ejected it from the station. And they knew that it was going to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and burn up. Well, it didn't entirely burn up. One chunk of it, a stanchion that sits in between the battery packs, was able to survive all the way through re-entry and crashed into this poor guy's house. Now, NASA officials came and retrieved the sample, and they're attempting to figure out why this chunk didn't burn up in re-entry the way the rest did. This method of disposing of garbage in space is very common. When they deorbit progress cargo vessels, they just burn them up in the atmosphere and everything is expected to be destroyed. And so if you've got chunks that can actually make it all the way back through to Earth, they should redesign a little bit. So I think that's what NASA is going to do now. Are these the first stars in the universe? The sun is a third generation star, and that means that it is polluted by heavy metals. Now, of course, astronomers refer to metals as any element that is beyond helium on the periodic table of elements. So oxygen is a metal. And when I say polluted, I mean like there's a little bit of these other elements inside the sun. It's still mostly hydrogen and helium, but it does have these additional metals. And astronomers have found a previous generation of stars which are metal poor. But it's always been theorized that there are the first stars, the stars that formed out of the primordial hydrogen and helium helium left over from the Big Bang. And so you would just get pure hydrogen, pure helium. And what kinds of stars you can get from that, we kind of don't know. It's theorized that maybe the way these work is a little different. You could have stars that are maybe thousands of times more massive than the sun, tens of thousands of times more massive than the sun. So these are known as population three stars. I'm like, why is the sun a population one star? Well, it's the third generation and the population three stars, the first generation, like that's a whole other thing. The problem with trying to observe these population three stars is that they are just enshrouded in the larger gas that they are forming out of. Like think about a stellar nebula, right? You look at a nebula and you can't see the stars that are forming inside the gas and dust. They are obscured. And so as astronomers use even the most powerful telescopes, James Webb, they can't see into this initial primordial gas to see those stars forming. But the theory is that there should be these reserves of this primordial gas in the outskirts of galaxies. And if you look at an early enough point in the universe, you might see the signature of stars forming in these primordial gas clouds. So they're not necessarily the first stars that formed in the universe, but they're the same kind of stars as you would get in the early universe. So there's a great survey by James Webb called Jades, where they are examining plenty of these really distant galaxies in the universe. And one very famous one is known as GNZ11. And it is seen at a time when the universe was only about 440 million years old. And astronomers were using James Webb and they were measuring the chemical signature coming from this galaxy and they detected the presence of a very specific wavelength of light that is emitted by helium. And it's theorized that you wouldn't get this emission of radiation unless you had large quantities of these primordial stars forming. And their measurements are to like five sigma of accuracy, which is like a lot of sigmas. So this is really strong evidence that we're starting to see the chemical signature, the kinds of stars that probably formed right at the very beginning of the universe. Back to the drawing board with Mars sample return. All right, we've been on tenterhooks recently waiting to find out what's going to happen with the Mars sample return mission. We got those budgetary cuts at NASA. 
we've seen issues across many of its missions. And of course, their flagship mission for the next couple of decades is going to be the Mars sample return mission. This works with the Perseverance rover, which is currently crawling around on the surface of Mars. It is going to the most scientifically fascinating, geologically interesting places, places where you've got sedimentary rock that's forming that maybe was underwater for long periods of time, or sand or really interesting mineral formations like the geologists, they obsess over each one one of these places and then they have perseverance do a core sample and carefully put it into a sample container and carry it inside its belly. And the plan was that once it had about 30 of these samples, then a mission would be sent from Earth, it would fly to Mars, it would land on the surface of Mars, it would meet up with perseverance, hand over the samples, and then it would launch off the surface of Mars, meet up with a return vehicle, probably designed by the European Space Agency, and then come back home. And if everything worked out great, then it would probably get those samples into the hands of researchers by 2031. And the budget was creeping up to like $11 billion. Well, NASA had an independent review where they went over the work so far and the plans for the future. And they said, No, actually, the budget is probably going to expand. And we're probably not going to get those samples back until 2040. And so this is becoming untenable. And so this week, NASA announced that they're going back to the drawing board, they are reaching out to a bunch of external providers, they're potentially going to narrow down the scope of the mission, maybe not 30 samples, maybe they're just going to bring back 10 samples maybe one sample, but they're asking for suppliers to tell them how they can maybe bring down the cost, bring the timeline more in line with what people's expectations are. Now I'm going to talk some more about this at the end of this episode. So stick around for that. The closest black hole found. You know, I love the European Space Agency's Gaia mission. If you're like looking for Fraser bingo, check it off. Uh, and that's because it has been charting the positions of billions of stars in the Milky Way. But it's also able to find some really interesting astronomical objects. And one of these is black holes, it is measuring the position of stars in the sky, watching as they move across the sky. But it can also see tiny little circles that a star might form if it is being orbited by a much more massive black hole. And so so far, astronomers have found two of these black holes. And this week, they announced they found a third designated BH three. So like you got BH one BH two, this one is very different from the black holes that have been seen so far. It has about 33 times the mass of the sun, the previous ones were only like up to about 10 times the mass of the sun. And what makes it really interesting is that it's only about 2000 light years away. So that's relatively close. Astronomically speaking, is this the closest black hole to us? Probably not. There's probably ones that aren't in a binary system that we wouldn't notice and are probably very close. But still, you don't have to worry. Um, there's nothing that a black hole 2000 light years away can do to us. But it's still scientifically fascinating and interesting that one of these was found in our relative neighborhood. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best space news of the week. And last week, it was almost a three way tie between a rainbow on an exoplanet, the Japanese moon rover, and the upcoming dark energy results from Desi. So thank you everybody who voted. It's fun to see when we have one that's just a complete landslide. And in this case, opinions are mixed. I'm sure like I saw in the comments, like a lot of people are like, Oh, why do you make me choose? Got to choose. That's what votes are about. Even when it's tough. So you're going to see the vote pop up in our channel on the community tab within about 24 hours of when we release this episode. Of course, if you're subscribed to the channel, if you've watched a bunch of our videos, click on the notifications bell that gives a much bigger chance that you'll see the vote come through your feed and go ahead, just give us a vote, tell us what you thought was best. An electromagnetic shield to deal with moon dust. People always wonder what we're going to do about moon dust and Mars dust. This stuff is a problem for different reasons. On the moon, you've got this crunched up glass like pieces of lunar rock, which are incredibly sharp, jagged. They kind of have put their hooks into whatever they touch. And we know that it causes wear and tear on machinery, problems with spacesuits. It can get into the lungs of the astronauts. We need to have a way to mitigate and deal with this stuff. And then on Mars, this stuff coats 
solar panels, camera systems, and eventually this is what takes out rovers on Mars that are powered by solar panels. So NASA has known about this problem for a long time. They have been working on some kind of electromagnetic shield for decades, since the 60s. But only recently is this technology starting to come together. And that's because the dust is electromagnetically charged. You can't just sweep it away, you can't blow it away, you can't tilt your solar panels to make this stuff fall off, it clings onto it. And the analogy that I always use is like, think about pollen in the spring, that sort of yellow pollen that sticks to your car windshield. And if you try just like sweeping it away, nope, that doesn't work. It's like glued on. It's only when you wash it, can you actually remove it. And so NASA is hoping that if you can cover various components on your spacecraft with this electromagnetic shield, you'll actually repel the dust before it lands. They've been testing this technology on the International Space Station, and it's been able to handle the rigors of vacuum quite well. Now they're planning to send an experiment to the moon as part of an upcoming lunar lander by the Firefly Corporation. So they're gonna send this instrument, it's going to attempt to repel the dust on the moon, and if that works, then they'll probably have a version they'll be able to use for Mars, and this problem could start to go away. We've had a revolution at Universe Today in the last couple of years, and that's because more and more people are signing on to join our Patreon club. And at a time when advertising is problematic at best, diminishing at worst, and I have to think about all of the people who work on our team and I have to be able to pay their salaries and cover our server costs and all of our equipment, all of that. And Thanks to Patreon, we have been able to just coast right through it. At a time when it feels like the media landscape is cratering, pardon the astronomical pun, all around us, we're able to keep going strong and get better thanks to our patrons. So if you want to help support the work we do, help create a completely independent space reporting group, go to patreon.com slash universe today. And you'll get a bunch of the standard benefits. You'll get our patron only podcast feed. You'll get a behind the scenes stuff on videos that we do, but really you will support and make us strong and allow us to just continue the work we do no matter what happens in the media landscape from this point forward. The hint of an exomoon around a brown dwarf. Astronomers have been using James Webb to study brown dwarfs. These are known as failed stars. They, they're made of the same stuff as a main sequence star like the sun, but they have dramatically less mass. And we know of dozens and dozens of them. And James Webb is the perfect instrument to be able to resolve them because they are bright in the infrared, but they're not very easy to see in visible light. And so one intriguing brown dwarf that James Webb has been looking at is one with between six and 35 times the mass of Jupiter. So much less mass than the smallest possible main sequence star. It's very cold, I mean, for stars, it only has about 200 degrees Celsius surface temperature. According to the researchers, that's about the temperature you would want to bake cookies. But what's weird about this brown dwarf is that it is emitting methane. And this is the kind of thing that you can see in planets and other brown dwarfs, but usually they are absorbing methane, not emitting methane. They also found that this brown dwarf seems to have some kind of temperature inversion where the temperatures are getting higher as you get further up in the atmosphere. And the weirdest part of this is that there seems to be the presence of an aurora. And you know, we have auroras here on Earth, we have them at Jupiter, and you get an aurora when the magnetic field of your planet, or in this case, brown dwarf, is interacting with the solar wind from a star, but there's no star. So where's it coming from? So one really intriguing possibility is that this brown dwarf has a large moon as a companion, and that is helping to create ions in its presence, that's creating the auroras, helping with the temperature inversion, helping with the methane. So is this the first moon for a brown dwarf? What do you call? Is it a planet? What do you call a brown dwarf moon? A planet? I don't know. Finally, I wanna show you this really cool image that came from the Daniel K. Inoue Solar Telescope in Maui. Now, it was watching the sun like it always does, and this is the most powerful solar telescope that's ever been built, and it was watching the sun during the recent solar eclipse. Now, it was way far away from the solar eclipse track, but it did see a slight partial solar eclipse. And so in this video, you can actually see 
as the moon is passing in front of the sun. And the resolution is so high, you can see the mountains and jagged features on the moon lit up against the sun in the background. It's an amazing sequence of images. Can you imagine if a solar eclipse went straight over Maui? and we got a chance to see that from this telescope. That would be really cool. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is a space news website where we publish between 30 and 40 space news stories every week. I mean, we condense it down to six to eight here for Space Bites, but there's many more interesting stories that we're working on. And I write a weekly email newsletter that collects all those stories together. It's completely free. I write every word, there's no ads. And I wanna give you just a couple of examples of some of the stories that you're gonna see in the newsletter that you won't see here on Space Bites. For example, new evidence that explains how Pluto got this weird heart-shaped feature on its surface. Could neutron stars be getting heated up by dark matter annihilation? And are Titan's dunes made of cometary dust? Intriguing. You're gonna to wanna to go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. Now, I'm going to rant about the Mars Sample Return Mission, but first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew M. Gross, Dennis Alberti, Dougie Stewart, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Mark Anstist, Modso, Paul Rohrbach, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Filer Munley, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. It's funny when I talk to people about the Mars Sample Return mission and they hear the budget is gonna be $10 billion, $11 billion, that the timeline is gonna take between 2030 and maybe all the way out to 2040. And then you get this like, why don't they just? Why don't they just do it for cheaper? Why don't they just do it more quickly? Well, these things take as long as they take and they cost as much as they cost. And I've even heard people say, well, look, why don't we just wait for the human explorers to go to Mars and then they can just bring back samples when they come home. Well, think about what you have to do to have a Mars sample return mission. You launch a rocket from Earth, it flies to Mars, it enters the atmosphere of Mars, it lands safely on the surface, it collects samples from the surface, it then launches from the surface of Mars, back up into space, it returns to Earth, and returns turns the capsule containing the samples safely back through the atmosphere into the hands of scientists. Think about what you have to do if you're going to send humans to Mars. It's the exact same thing. So in other words, you can't send humans to Mars until you have demonstrated that you can bring rocks home from Mars. The process is exactly the same. And that this process is going to cost what it costs. I mean, I think we have these science fiction expectations that stuff is going to be, it should be simpler, it should be cheaper. Like, why are you telling me that it's going to cost $10 billion? I watch Star Trek and it says it should only cost $5 billion. Well, that was Star Trek or The Expanse or whatever. And so, yeah, NASA is going to go back to the drawing board. They're going to reach out to new suppliers. They're hoping to come up with a way. Maybe someone's got some kind of Hail Mary idea that nobody's ever thought of, but I don't think so. I think that if we want samples from the surface of Mars, it's going to cost what it costs. It's going to take as long as it takes. You can try to decrease those costs, but you're gonna have to cut corners, you're gonna increase risk. You can try to shorten that time frame, but that's gonna increase risk, or you can, you're can you gonna have to spend more money. And in the end, as we saw with James Webb, as we're seeing with the Artemis, it just is an expensive process. And yet, if scientists on Earth with their incredible, modern, high-tech labs could get their hands on 30, well-chosen samples from what is likely the most interesting part of Mars when it relates to the possibilities of life. Like Jezero Crater, this place was underwater for a long period of time, no question. Those samples are gonna be beautiful, and if they get into the hands of the scientists, they will find life, find evidence of life, or disprove evidence of life, they will be able to do really incredible work. And it's just gonna take how long as it takes, it's gonna cost what it costs. And Good luck going back to the drawing board. My guess is when you finish off this new drawing board, it's going to look very similar to the previous drawing board. And so then it's just a question of, is this a priority or not? Do you want these samples or do you not want them? If you don't want them, no problem. There's lots of other priorities. But if you want them, it's going to be expensive and it's going to take a while, but the science will be worth it. All right, we'll see you next week.